everyone. It's so nice to see you. I'm Dr. Heiko Kruzman, and I'm absolutely delighted that you've joined me in the session on engagement and on the Insights on Demand event today. And in the current situation, when things seem more uncertain than ever before, engaging our learners is clearly very much on the forefront of every teacher's mind. So to start with, I have a little fun challenge for you. And that challenge is that near the end of the session, I will ask you to type in the chat box a few things that you learned about me during this talk. And every now and then I will drop in a little snippet of a fact about me. So invitation to keep an ear out for that. And also, I invite you to type into the chat box um, during the session. And the chat is an opportunity for us to connect and for us uh, to, um, to share our thoughts and with other people uh, uh, here. And I will definitely go back and read every single one of your contributions because this is really important to me. So today, we're going to look at the questions of what we know from research works for engaging our learners. So. Um, what is engagement? What are the building blocks of engagement? And we're also going to look at some practical ideas of what that may look like in the classroom to give you the inspiration and the confidence to use these um, with success in your own teaching. So what is engagement? Right, so the definition of engagement that I'm going with today is from a book that has uh, come out last year, and this is by Professor Sarah Mercer and Zoltan Jounjai, and these are both uh, highly respected researchers in the field of um, language um, motivation, uh, language learning motivation and engagement, and the book is called Engaging Language Learners in Contemporary Classrooms. And um, don't worry about taking notes uh, because I've listed the full reference of this book and any other publications that I will mention during this talk, so there is no need for you to take any notes right now. So um, I've got my copy of this book here and you can see that it is um, very well used and I just wanted to share it with you because the research and the ideas that I'm talking about today uh, very much chime with its focus of looking at research and on engagement in terms of what's actually helpful for teachers in the online and offline classroom. So Sarah Mercer and Zoltan Jounjai define engagement as uh, active participation and involvement uh, in learning activities. And often people here ask, well, what's the difference here between engagement and motivation? And the key difference is that you can be as motivated as you like, maybe you have some very important and um, overarching reasons for learning English, but if you're not actively engaging in the learning process, then you're not learning. And very often when we're talking about motivating our learners, what we really mean is engaging our learners in the learning task in the face of many distractions coming their way. And just one example of this are mobile phones, which are really designed to hijack our attention. And certainly in my own teaching, and I've taught all age groups, but mainly teenagers and adults, and I've certainly experienced students getting very distracted by mobile phones. And maybe you can share in the chat whether you've also experienced this, um, but just by typing the word yes. And I very much expect this to be a common experience. Experience. Now, it's probably true that even if students don't really want to give in to the distractions, often they just don't know how to escape uh, from the magnetic pull. And this is exactly where you as a teacher can come in to help them focus and to engage them on the task. So how do you do that? Right, so to answer that, let's look at some key factors that we know from research are the building blocks of language learner engagement. And I would like to go through these building blocks now with you, and together we'll look at selected research insights for each one, and then suggest some action points which you can implement in your own teaching. But the main point is always to really understand what the underlying principle of engagement means for our learners. Right, so think about a situation that many of us are facing right now, and this is certainly the case in the UK where I live, that you really, you can't be sure of the classroom conditions uh, which you're going to face uh, for the foreseeable future. It could be face-to-face, um, -face, it could be online. Sometimes you plan a face-to-face lesson, but then you have to move online with no notice at all, or you have to do a mixture of both. And you don't know about your student's situation either, because you've not actually seen them or talked to them um, one-to-one -one in ages possibly. So you expect some students will have done some, some of the work that you set them, some of them will have done none of it, but you're very aware that whatever situation um, they're in, there's lots of work to get on with and there's massive pressure to get things done. So it's Monday morning, you open up your classroom and you say, happy Monday, everyone. And all your students are looking at you like this. 
Now, what happened there? Can you type into the chat just one word that expresses how you think your students are feeling at that moment with that expression on their face? Don't think too hard, just type in one word that comes to your mind. Right, so it's probably fair to say that we recognize exactly how students are feeling because it might not be a happy Monday for them at all, right? So your students probably have all sorts of things on their mind and learning about English grammar may just not be uh, on their top list of priorities. And you just don't know what's going on for them, what state of mind they're in. So your mind may be focused on the importance of getting work done, but your students may not be uh, in the same kind of uh, a frame of mind to even take in anything you're saying, let alone engage with any of the learning tasks that you may give them. So it's very, very important that when thinking about learner engagement, we start right at the beginning. And that is the social relatedness among everyone in your class. So we know from research that our willingness to engage in learning is strongly affected by social relations within the group. And that refers to two relationships. The first one is the relationship between you as the teacher and your students. Now, you can perform the most singing and dancing roadshow with all the latest technology and resources. You can play games or lesson long. If you don't have a good relationship with your students, if your students don't believe that you genuinely care about them, then they're very unlikely to be willing to engage. Because it's actually very hard to concentrate and care about the finer points of English grammar when you're feeling these negative emotions that, you, that you've just shared shared in the chat. And um, this is why it's highly likely that your students will look back at you, uh, much like that grumpy cat was looking in the picture just now, even if you can't actually see their faces in the offline classroom. Now, the second very important aspect of social relatedness is the peer-to-peer -peer relationship amongst the students themselves. And learners also need to feel comfortable in interacting with others in the group so that they feel happy about trying out new language and giving and receiving feedback. And studies have shown that students who have positive relationships with their peers have higher levels of engagement, motiva motivation and achievement. So it's clear from the research that a positive, supportive group culture underpins all learner motivation and engagement. And this also contributes to the well-being of everyone involved. And it is really no coincidence that principles of motivation and engagement very much align with principles of well-being. So this is a good reminder for our work in the classroom as teachers that when we're interacting with our class, um, to always ensure that the group culture is supporters, supportive, that we've made the purpose of our interactions with others inside and out of lessons clear and meaningful, and that we tuned into our emotional intelligent, intelligence as much as uh, we're focused on the cognitive aspects of learning. Now, this is not an optional nice to have extra. This is based on empirical research data, which says that a positive social emotional group climate is a fundamental condition for engagement that underlies all others. Okay, so let's look at some ideas of what you can do to support a healthy and positive climate in the group. And uh, one idea might be to share something personal with your students, because this builds a relationship of trust. So encourage your learners to share something appropriate with the rest of the class. For example, you could invite them to bring in an object and talk about it for a minute in what's often called a show and tell. And this kind of activity is great for this and also works very well online in the whole group or using breakout rooms rooms uh, for smaller groups. So for example, for myself, I like to travel. Um, I don't know if the picture is big enough, but um, you could you probably guessed based on the uh, big map of the world behind me, not that there's much travel going on right now, but I might still show my class a postcard and start a discussion that way. And postcards I find are a really good hook for creating a talking point. And you can even start a class collection of postcards or any picture cards really that learners can share that they have an interest in. And this would be a great way to share something personal, which strengthens connections within the class. Second, it's very much worth thinking about what is referred to as the three R's. And the three R's here are rules, roles, and routines. And these three reinforce the idea of purposeful, intentional interaction. And it's especially important to think about rules afresh for managing the online classroom with a whole new format and behavior etiquette so that you can use this context to involve your students in discussing those rules and why they're necessary and really that they're here to keep everybody safe. And this shows your students that you care about them. 
Roles are helpful for students to concentrate on a specific responsibility. So you could assign different roles to students for group work and then swap roles so that they're learning different skills. So for example, you could assign the roles of fact checker or summarizer or note taker, spokesperson, timekeeper, and so on. You get the idea. And the last R is for routines. Now routines really help to provide structure and security. And this is especially important when things feel uncertain and it helps everyone to feel a little less overwhelmed, hopefully. And all of these three R's of rules, roles and routines, they can be implemented very well online as well as in the face-to-face -face classroom. The third action point for supporting social relatedness is to use collaborative tasks as much as possible. And using smaller groups or even just pairs is a really good way to strengthen bonds between learners. And this also teaches students collaboration skills, and which is a key life competency and will come in useful much beyond your language class as well. So I'd like to invite you now to suggest by typing into the chat what kind of activities you think would work in your own teaching to strengthen teacher-student rapport and to build positive group dynamics. And here I've put just a few examples of activities that may do that. So one represents setting up group rules, two is using the Padlet tool for whole class collaboration. And I know uh, some of you are using this tool uh, to connect as we speak, so this is really great. You could also use Padlet as a class wall to build and visually represent a group identity. And three is sharing something personal in a show and tell type of activity. So these would just be a few examples of activities that would strengthen the social relatedness in your class. And um, thank you for all your lovely con contributions as well. Don't forget that you can always, like me, go back to the recording of the session and go over the chat contributions in more detail. Thank you so much for all your suggestions. Let's move on to another key building block of engagement, which is self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is the belief of I can do it. Now, research tells us that we engage more in learning if we believe that we can be successful in the task. And for this, though, it's very important that the task is just challenging enough to be manageable, but still represent an achievement. And tied in with this notion of self-efficacy is the idea of a growth mindset. And a growth mindset means a belief that improvement is possible. And it is this belief which enables learners to deal better with difficulties and setbacks by framing these as challenges that can be overcome. So what practical things can we do then to support self-efficacy in our students? Okay, well, we need to provide plentiful opportunities for success, and we can do that by setting incremental goals at increasing level of challenge. And that's so that we give learners the confidence that they can be successful at a task by, uh, by staggering achievements. For this, you will most likely need to use differentiation. Now, don't, par don't panic because often teachers' hearts sink at the mention of differentiation because they think it means extra work and, and everyone knows teachers just don't have the time for that and I understand that better than anyone. But don't worry because differentiation does not mean extra work. It does not have to mean extra work for you. So for example, you could set a reading tech, uh, t a task where the text and the questions are getting increasingly more challenging and then you can say to learners, okay, so this text starts off easy and it gets harder with each paragraph. So I'd like you to choose where to start. So look at paragraph one. If that's way too easy, go to paragraph two, look at that one, start there. If you're feeling even more confident, start at paragraph three and so on. So you choose your own starting point. And in this way, you've um, had to only design one single activity for the whole class. And uh, also this activity builds up the challenge in incremental steps. And it also offers differentiation with no extra work for yourself. The second action point for self-efficacy is to make progress visible. Now, sometimes it's hard for learners to see how far they've come already, and you can help build their confidence by visualizing their achievements. And it's actually really important to celebrate also the small wins and not just the big milestones. And a few ways in which you can do this is, for example, through a traffic-like system or through exit tickets where learners rate their understanding of the lesson. And uh, one example is the free formative uh, assessment tool Socrative, which does this very well, or student portfolios or achievement journals, 
where students collect samples of their work throughout the course. And research tells us that journaling is very good for us for a huge range of reasons. It is actually very satisfying also to look back on what you've achieved already. And this can be done on paper and displayed in class as well as online. One thing I want to say though, to bear in mind about goals and achievement, it's important to remember that we are not our achievements. Our achievements are outcomes. They do not affect our worth as human beings. So while goals and achievements are important, make sure that your success criteria are about the process and about outcomes and that they're not linked with identity and self-worth. Very important because identity and self-worth should always be treated as inherent both for yourself and for your learners. Okay, last for self-efficacy is feedback. Now, feedback is crucial to get right. And to my mind, the most important thing about feedback is that it should be encouraging. Our brains are naturally wired to home in on negative feedback. And this can sometimes block out the many positive comments that we are also receiving. Feedback should also be meaningful, and that means it's not good enough to say to your learners, well done, good job, and move on, but to use SMART criteria, S-M-A-R-T, SMART, we we'll probably uh, all know and not always love this uh, for goal setting for our own CPD, but I think it works very well for feedback. So a reminder here that we've got to be specific in our, uh, in our feedback to learners, uh, setting measurable and achievable goals. The feedback has to be relevant and it's got to be delivered in a timely manner so that the window of opportunity for learning is not lost. Okay, now let's pause a minute, um, because if all this talk of instilling this I can do it mindset makes you a little uncomfortable with its um, positive thinking focus on encouraging self-talk and attitudes, don't worry, I'm with you on that. Because envisaging positive outcomes can feel a little bit like wishful, wishful thinking uh, if it's not borne out by reality. And there is actually research which shows that if people dream too much about achieving their goals, they achieve less than if they didn't. And that's because if in their dreams they've already achieved their goal, then they may, they may feel less of a drive in real life to actually make things happen. So I'd like to share with you a goal setting tool that I really like, and that's the uh, WHOOP tool developed by Professor Gabriele Oettingen, and that's from her book, Rethinking Positive Thinking, and again, you will find the full reference for this book at the end. WHOOP is an acronym, and that st uh, stands for Wish, Outcome, Obstacle, and Plan. And you can use this with your students for achieving their goals by helping them to anticipate obstacles to their learning and then identify strategies to overcome these obstacles. And these, uh, this latter part is called implementation intention. So for example, a student's wish could be to improve their grammar skills and the outcome would be that they do well in their end of year exam. Now, when it comes to the obstacle, you're only allowed to list something inside of you that is stopping you from achieving your goal. And this does away with all the excuses that we're in the habit of making of why something can't be done. The idea is that you, once you realize it was you who put the obstacle there in the first place, then you can also overcome it. And you can overcome it by setting a path to action with an if-then scenario. So for, my, for myself, an example would be that I also get easily distracted by uh, alerts coming up on my phone and two of my favorite apps uh, that can really sap my attention, they are Twitter and Instagram. So I've made a rule for myself that if I'm working, then I will leave my phone in another room. And maybe you can also think of some ways in which you can use the WHOOP tool with your students to help them not just set, but also achieve their goals. And like me, you may find that it works for yourself and your own goals as well. Okay, next up, I have a question for you, and I'm giving you a choice now of what you would like to do next. And the choice is either green or blue. So just type in the word green or blue in the chat box. What would you like to do next? Okay, I think we will go with green and that brings us to the next building block of learner engagement, which is agency. Now, to be clear, what I mean by agency and why I'm using the term agency over the term autonomy is because by autonomous learning, teachers often mean that learners do the work without the teacher present. So for example, doing homework. 
But agency, the way that I mean it here, this is about making choices. And that's a difference to working autonomously, or at least how the word is often used in a teaching context. So the aspect that I'm stressing here is to feel in possession of the locus of control. And that's because research into agency tells us that we learn better when we can control <clears throat> aspects of what, when, and how we learn. And maybe take a moment to notice how you were feeling when I offered you a choice, choice just there about what to do next, green or blue. So there you were exercising your, your agency, even though you didn't even know what the choice was about. So in your teaching, wherever possible, provide um, opportunities uh, for choice and voice. Now, I really like this phrase because it ex expresses um, in a very clear way uh, what we should try and build into our teaching. I think I jumped um, ahead there uh, in, my, in my presentation. So I really like, to, I like this phrase because it expresses what we should try and build into our teaching. And here sometimes people think, yes, but we don't really have much choice. It's in the exam and we don't have a choice about teaching. So I would encourage you to focus not on what you can't change, but on what you can change. And if you focus your attention and creative thinking on, on that, you will be surprised how you will find lots of areas where you do have at least some degree of choice, I'm sure. But to distinguish between what is in your power to control and what isn't, that can be a massive distinction. So it's worth taking a moment to prize it apart and to identify which is which, so that you can direct your energy only in the areas where you can influence things. And studies have shown that focusing on what is within your power to change rather than what isn't is not just helpful for our engagement and learning, but it's also good for our health and well-being. Right, another point to make here is that too much choice can also feel quite overwhelming. So to avoid making choices too confusing, it's a good idea to keep them contained within a structure. For example, for a writing task, you could offer students two options for the output format. For example, writing a formal letter or an informal text message, but to express the same content. Or you could turn it around and keep the format the same, but offer a choice on the content. So for example, the task could be to write a blog post to persuade readers to donate to charity, but then you could let students choose a charity that they would want people to support. The second point to support learner agency says that we want to foster a culture of learner-centered learning. And project-based learning is ideal for that. And that's because projects put learners in an active role and allow them to make decisions. If you're involved in a project and you have a very specific role and very tangible outcomes, like acting in a play, for example, then you can't just sit there and let it wash over you. You have to participate and you just have to engage through the nature of the task. Last, think of yourself as a coach rather than as a teacher. Now, this is more of a mental shift in how we often traditionally think of ourselves as teachers. But it might be helpful to reflect on that if we want to uh, think of the learner as at the center of their own learning, then this means that we as a teacher, we have to move over a little bit from the center uh, of learning, okay, to make room for the learner and for us to support her or him from the sidelines like a coach. And in the classroom, this means not to just focus on the student's language achievement, but also on their psychological state and teaching them more general learning strategies and skills. Okay, so now I have a little task for you, and I want to show you a reading text that slipped in there uh, earlier, which is the text here on the right on the yellow background. Now, don't worry, there's no need to actually read the whole text at all. It's just really to give you an idea of a source text that might typically be used in ELT, very much dependent on the age group and the level that you teach, of course. And I would like to invite you to have, um, have a think of some ways in which you could use a text like this in your own teaching in a way that's a supports learning a learner agent agency. So feel free to share this in the chat. And I've put a reminder on the side here, what aspects you could think about for this, which are choice and voice, project based learning and teaching learning to learn skills. So do feel free to type in the chat your ideas of how you could um, use a text uh, like this uh, to support uh, um, aspects of learner agency. And I'm sure you have lots of brilliant ideas. Um, 
I'm just going to pick a, a one example for each category. So for choice and voice, um, you could offer a choice of tasks. Uh, for example, um, you could design a choice board like this, uh, which is a notes and crosses or tic-tac-toe style board is also called. And you can put a task in each of the boxes and learners can then choose a task from each row. So again, it offers choice, but it's very much within a structure. And for the middle box where the star is, you could ask learners to come up with an idea for a task themselves. So this would be an opportunity for learners to express their voice and make a meaningful contribution to the learning process. For project-based learning, you could build this text into a larger project where groups of learners can choose their own focus. For example, it could be global companies or marketing or environmental concerns, or it could be a language focus such as giving instructions using uh, the example of putting up flat pack furniture. These are all rooted in real life situations and uh, that's usually at the heart of project-based learning. And last, for learning to learn skills, one way in which you could address this would be to teach students decoding strategies, such as to pay attention to clues from the title, to images, to work out meaning based uh, on context, to use their knowledge of cognates from their L1 or any other languages. And all of this is to provide them with a repertoire of strategies, which they can use to exercise agency and make choices, which will engage them more fully. Okay, so at the beginning, I told you that I would be dropping in some small factual details about myself all through this talk. And so now I'm asking you just type into the chat, what have you learned about me, uh, me so far? So there are a few facts about me. And um, I think I mentioned that I live in the UK. I taught uh, all ages uh, of learners, but mainly teenagers and adults. I like to travel when I can, and I like Twitter and Instagram, and I get distracted by myself. Uh, I get distracted by them myself. So um, I think probably lots of you noticed this and remembered these tiny little bit, uh, bit of snippets uh, of information, which I planted at random intervals. But here's another question for you. Would you have noticed or remembered any of this if I hadn't told you to listen out for it? And I'm guessing probably not or not as much. So what I did there, was to activate your sense of curiosity. And we know from research that curiosity is an important condition for learning and it can be triggered in response to uncertainty. So these facts about me would be new information for you. And also importantly, you never knew when the next one would happen. So there's some unpredictability around this. And we know from uh, research in neuroscience that unpredictable rewards or stimuli are highly engaging. And in fact, much of the um, addictive power of gaming is based on this concept. So you could do something similar in your lessons. You could tell learners to listen out for you mentioning, I don't know, five names of animals at random intervals and write them down or check them off a bingo card. Or you can hold up a series, a series of mini whiteboards with a word or a picture clue that learners have to spot while you're teaching them something else entirely. So they must keep a, a a watch out uh, if they don't want to miss the clues. And again, this is something that can work very well online and offline and in synchronous as well as in asynchronous teaching. Okay, so now let me ask you something. Imagine someone gives you two presents. Lucky you. One of the presents is wrapped and one is not. Which one is the more exciting presents? present? The one that's wrapped or the one that's unwrapped? the wrapped one, right? So I'm guessing lots of you will think that it's the wrapped one. And that's because it's just so much more interesting for us to discover something, something for ourselves rather than to just be presented with the informa information straight up. And so in the same way, um, letting learners um, uh, find things out for themselves is more engaging than just presenting them with the information. And you can use this for topic content, but also you can use this for working out the rules of language. And the discovery or the inductive approach where learners work out something for themselves based on examples and guidance is popular for that reason. Second is that we all have an inbuilt urge to find out how things work. And that's what's sometimes called the mental itch. So you can create this mental itch that your students will want to scratch, hopefully, by using elements of surprise or mystery. And we're all familiar with highly effective attention-grabbing strategies that use this in advertising, in the media, in films, and in books. So we know that this works. And one way of using it in your teaching would be to end on a cliffhanger and get learners to speculate about what happened next. And this is related to the last point, which is, use the power of stories. 
Again, as humans, we're all naturally attracted to a storyline. It's not just that we want to find out what happens next, but it's also that we remember information more effectively when it's structured in narrative format, because that's how our brains work. Um, it's a format that's very familiar to us and we instinctively relate to it well and we retain the information better that way. So stories appeal not just to younger learners where they are most commonly used, commonly used, but really you can use stories with learners of any age and that stories as input, but don't forget you can also set creative tasks where learners are the storytellers. And that works very well with old school pen and paper, but uh, there are also some lovely digital tools as well, such as sto uh, Storybird and Storyboard, My Story, and I'm sure you know some others as well. And if you do, feel free to share them in the chat uh, or uh, uh, on the Padlet. So for ourselves as teachers as well, we need to stay curious about life, about other people, about ourselves. As teachers, we naturally love learning, or I assume we do, I think most people do, and curiosity embodies this value more than any others. Uh, so sometimes it just takes a little nudge to remind ourselves and our learners of the curiosity that we had as a child when everything is new and um, every day is full of exciting opportunities because as we get older this can get overshadowed by fearful feelings which can stand in the way of being fully and openly and creatively engaged in the present so again invitation to you to connect with that natural joyful curiosity which helps us to grow and learn so as the last point for engagement, I'm saying to you, don't forget to enjoy yourself. And this is official advice, because we know from research that we are more motivated to engage in learning tasks, which we enjoy. So especially in language teaching, do foster positive emotions, do capture what is called FLE, foreign language enjoyment, because enjoyment is positively correlated with achievement. And this means that we enjoy what we're good at and we're good at what we enjoy. So do draw on humor and getting learners active on using visuals, music. Again, you know your learners best. So design tasks that are appropriate, uh, that you both enjoy, what suits your context and the age group that you're teaching. Now, don't be worried that if you're laughing with your class, that the message could be that the lesson isn't serious or that it is not important. This is not the case at all, because we do take learning very seriously. But that does not mean that we have to take ourselves too seriously. And this can be done in a very authentic and lighthearted way. So for example, if something amusing has happened to you in your life that may be appropriate to share with your students, then you could just try doing that and see how that goes. And you can also ask your students to share something funny with you in return. So use activities which you and your learners enjoy together. Have some fun together. So your students seeing you enjoying teaching them and sharing a laugh with them, that will help them to connect with you on a human level. And it will again build social connections and trust. And it is this social relatedness which we've seen at the beginning and which we all know really as practicing teachers is the underpinning of all successful learner engagement. And from this stem, the other building blocks of engagement, which we talked about, which are um, self-efficacy, agency, curiosity, and enjoyment. And if you address these building blocks in your teaching, then any activities based on them will be engaging for your students now and for the future, online, offline, and anything in between as well. So hopefully this session will have given you some ideas for tasks that are engaging, but most importantly, a sense of the bigger picture of the foundations that these kind of tasks are built on and why it matters for our learners, but also for ourselves and also for all of our relationships with others. So thank you so much for listening and for participating. And through that, you played a very important part in our session today. So thank you very much for that. And I hope um, that you enjoyed the session. And I also hope that you enjoy the rest of the Insights On Demand event too.